This 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E has been with us for just over a year and over 11,000 miles now. And that makes it prime time for us to give an update on what it's been like to live with Ford's first ground up purpose-built electric vehicle. In the time that it's been with us, the general consensus has been quite positive, as we expected, given that it won our top rated luxury EV award in 2021. And we defined that at the time as vehicles that cost over $40,000. Since then, times have changed and the Mach-E now competes against a very deep field of likely size and price competitors. Impressively, it still holds its own, sitting at second in our all-wheel drive EV SUV leaderboard just behind the Hyundai Ioniq 5. To find out what's going on with the rest of our long-term fleet, hit those like and subscribe buttons. And if you're interested in selling your car, head over to edmunds.com slash sellmycar for an instant cash offer. The Mach-E might live on our all-wheel drive EV SUV leaderboard, but the one that I'm sitting in right now that we bought is actually rear-wheel drive. This is a premium model, it's the mid-level trim, and it also comes with the extended range 88 kilowatt hour battery. And this configuration is actually the one that gives you the most range. All-wheel drive models have more power, but we wanted more range to test out, and to be honest, we kind of like the driving dynamics of the rear-wheel drive models a little bit more in these EVs. It comes with some impressive features like a panoramic glass roof, power tailgate, and Ford's hands-free Blue Cruise semi-automated driving assistance system. It also comes with this large 15.5 inch touchscreen that basically houses all the vehicle's controls. And this is an approach that has left us both hot and cold, as we'll get into later. For its as-tested price of $53,700, this vehicle feels rather well equipped. But of course, when we went to go buy it at the dealer, they wanted a 10K markup. We were able to negotiate that down a little bit, so our final purchase price came out to $61,700. We briefly considered buying a GT model, but we considered that big jump in price not to be worth it for the added performance. And you may have noticed this is a 2021 model that we didn't buy until 2022. That's because had we tried to order a 2022 at the time, it would have taken eight months for Ford to deliver the vehicle, but this one was already sitting on the lot. The centerpiece of this interior is the screen, and our editors had a lot to say about it, good and bad, but we'll start on a positive note. My time with the Mach-E was very comfortable with its nice materials and good build quality. I especially enjoyed the sound system and how easily connected to my phone throughout the CarPlay. And it stayed connected, unlike some other vehicles I've been in. The tech inside was also nice, with standout features for me being the large touch display and the wireless charging for my phone. However, having certain features like the climate control only being able to be used through the touch display makes it very difficult while driving, but most of the things I found myself using regularly had some sort of physical button, which is always great to have. There's a bit of Tesla to the Mach-E's interior as most of the vehicle's operations and controls are confined to the center screen, but the Mach-E does one thing differently than the Model Y, which I really like, in that it still has an instrument cluster here behind the wheel. It's a very simple one. It doesn't display too much information, but I actually kind of like that because everything you need is available at a quick glance rather than having to look over and down and to the right to see your speed or other things like that. I should note that while David had a great CarPlay experience, some of our other editors have reported problems specifically with wireless Apple CarPlay connectivity in this vehicle. And I should note that as an Android user, I've noticed wireless problems as well, though the wired connections for both seem to work flawlessly. This is something that we've taken our long-term Volkswagen ID.4 to task for as well over the past year, and it's only fair that we do the same to the Ford. And while David liked the screen controls, there is some dissent on that point. First of all, it's the reliance on the center screen to do practically everything. It's not that it, it's impossible to get used to or that it doesn't work, it works just fine. It's just that it's not as reliable as physical buttons. And I know we harp on this a lot, but occasionally the system will default to the hottest setting. Depends on the weather outside or something, but if the system's overworked, it'll just default to blasting the heat at the highest possible temperature. And on a hot summer day, we really don't love that. As he mentioned, this has been kind of a common refrain among our staff. We don't hate large screens at all. Big screen energy is kind of cool but there are certain controls that just work better as physical buttons. So Ford might be the first and maybe the only brand to implement this, but if you use Apple Maps in CarPlay, there's now a cool EV routing feature that can help plan charging stops and will even estimate the amount of battery charge you're gonna have left uh, once you get to your destination. 
This is cool because it means that the Mach-E is actually sharing its battery state of charge with your smartphone. Unfortunately, it only works with Apple Maps, which I almost never use because I prefer Google or Waze. This is the rear wheel drive version of the Mach-E, but even though it only has a single motor, it's still plenty of power. And it's got a pretty good zero to 60 mile an hour time, just 6.5 seconds in Edmunds testing. And that means that it has plenty of juice for day-to-day -day driving and it's easy to get on the highway and it maintains speed uh, without any problem at all. Our general impressions of driving the Mach-E have been pretty positive. The most memorable thing for me was how it was enjoyable to drive. There were two things that went into that. First was handling, just even around town running errands, uh, just kind of felt nimble and sporty, hunkered down, fun around turns. Uh, although I say that, I also remember driving with uh, a little bit more enthusiasm, shall we say, and the tires would start to screech like a bunch of monkeys in a tree, is kind of embarrassing. So you had to keep that, you know, within reason. But overall, uh, pretty just fun. Second thing, acceleration. Now our Mach-E premium test vehicle is quicker than your typical small gas powered SUV or even something like a Chevrolet Bolt EUV. So overall, yeah, it was a fun EV to drive and I think it did a pretty nice job of living up to the Mustang name. Now, if you live with any vehicle long enough, some cracks will start to show. When the Mach-E first arrived, and its only other competition was the Tesla Model Y and its notoriously stiff suspension, I thought the Mach-E was hugely comfortable. But now that there are a few more options in the market, I'm finding that the Mach-E is a bit less refined in the ride comfort department than what we first thought. The rear suspension is a little under damp, which leads to a bouncy ride, uh, especially if you're sitting in the back. So, you know, other options like the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Volkswagen 94 do a better job of controlling the motion back there. It's also not super stable under braking. So if you brake it really hard, you kind of feel the nose bobbing up and down. It doesn't control rebound very well. Now, impressively, you can drive the Mach-E for a long time. This vehicle has a range estimate of 300 miles, but in our Edmunds EV range test, it actually went 340 miles, putting it near the top of this class. One of the features on the Mach-E that we've been most excited to test out is Blue Cruise, and that's Ford's sort of answer to GM's Super Cruise. Now, our impressions of Blue Cruise have been a bit mixed. I got a lot more comfortable using Blue Cruise in the Mach-E the longer that we had it in our fleet. And I think that speaks to just how well the system usually works. You know, by the time that we were you know, getting ready to say goodbye to it, I no longer felt like I had to keep my hands hovering over the steering wheel every time that I activated it. It's still a weird feeling to not be holding the steering wheel all of the time when you're driving a car, but I think to Ford's credit, they developed a system that made that strange feeling a little less intimidating. I personally had a less than ideal experience with the Blue Cruise and the Mach-E. For me, it never really seemed to find the center of the lane and always ended up hugging one side or the other, much too close for my liking. Especially at freeway speeds when cornering, it got really close to the line, almost going into the next lane, or at least that's what it felt like. So I ended up keeping my hands on the wheel almost the entire time. In the end, I think I was more comfortable without it than with it while driving. We should note that there is a new version of Blue Cruise that we will be getting on our Mach-E and it's actually already out on 2023 versions of the Mach-E called Blue Cruise 1.2 and it adds a few features that should fix some of the pain points that we've had with the system. Uh, those include automatic lane changes, uh, the ability to slow down for curves, and as Ford says, an improved ability to position the car in the lane. So that will directly address some of the problems that David had. Um, we actually had a 2023 Mach-E in recently in a very similar spec to ours and we noticed a difference uh, not only in Blue Cruise but in how the screen worked as well. I'm here in our 2021 long-term Ford Mustang Mach-E and I recently drove a 2023. A couple of interesting things on the 2023 is that the infotainment screen is a lot more responsive and a lot sharper. Um, another thing that I'm looking forward to is the Blue Cruise update features because it will enhance that sensation and that well, operation. So um, we can't wait for that until we get that update. We actually discovered that our vehicle hasn't gotten a software update in about six months from Ford. We reached out to them to see why this might be the case, and they're still trying to figure out the reasons why. So we are missing a few updates on our vehicle, including one that would change the volume knob to allow it to also control the climate temperature. And that's an upgrade that would help to mitigate some of the issues that we've had with the climate controls as a whole. 
So until Ford kind of figures out why we haven't been able to get these updates, we're in a bit of a holding pattern. But we are definitely excited for our vehicle to eventually get the same upgrades that we enjoyed so much in the 2023 model. Unlike many of the mach -E's other updates, for this update, we're actually going to have to take the car into the dealership to get the firmware updated. Um, so keep an eye out on our long-term blog and here for our wrap-up video where we're going to talk about if that update made a difference. Super fans of the Edmunds long-term blog will note that our Mach-E arrived at about the same time our 2021 Volkswagen ID4 did. So we've actually lived with both of these electric vehicles for about the same amount of time. So I thought it might be interesting to poll our staff who have driven both to see which one they prefer. And the result was a landslide for the Blue Oval. 15 votes for the Mach-E and one lone dissenting vote for the ID4. One strong, brave, independent thinker who's willing to go against, all right, it was me. But even I will readily admit the Mach-E is a better vehicle. The reason I like the ID4 is kind of because it rides better, but it has all these other issues. I don't know, maybe it's because I don't like that Ford used the Mustang name on this vehicle. It's not a vote that makes sense, but it's one that I stand behind. The good news for anyone looking to scoop up a Mach-E these days is that it once again qualifies for a full federal tax credit of $7,500 because it's built in the good old US of A. I mean, I know the Ford's better, like it's faster. And how does that make you feel? Bad? I think it's, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's not a Mustang, right? Well, we'll continue it next week. Sorry for going over again. <laughs>